is another word of God through Jesus Christ, Street and Outreach Ministry. Raw and uncut productions. Uh, perfect time for the word. God bless you. We're getting ready to get into a powerful word. I'm getting ready to do some study. Y'all want to study with me? Come on and let's uh, let's see. You're watching the word of God through Jesus Christ Street and Irish Telecast, and I'm very grateful that you're here. Okay. Um, you can reach the ministry by calling four seven five. Three zero zero three eight five zero. And thank you so much for being a part of this broadcast. And watch this. Don't get caught up in the theatrics, but get caught up in the word. God bless you. My name is Apostle Alan E. Coleman Jr. The Lord has assigned me as apostle teacher and prophet of the word of God through Jesus Christ street and outreach ministry. Thank you for joining the ministry for this broadcast that God is doing today. I don't know what he's going to do. I don't even know if he's going to have friends with me or not. I don't know, but we're going to find out. You can reach the ministry at 475-300-3850-24 hours. The ministry's website is also on the screen, so that way you'll know how to join us on the web. Not only that, but periodically there will be the Cash App link on the screen so you can share love offerings to partner with us as God uses us to help others in street and outreach ministry. There's always ongoing fundraisers because God uses the ministry to help others just like he did when he walked this earth. God bless you, and let's get in here and find out what it is the Lord want to say unto us. Come on. To the Word of God through Jesus Christ with Apostle Alan E. Coleman Jr. God bless you and enjoy the message. Last time on the Word of God through Jesus Christ, Street and Our Telecast. Chapter 10, verse 12. We're going to jump right into a conversation between Gabriel and Daniel. Verse 12, then said he unto me, fear not, Daniel.
for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me, and I remained there with the kings of Persia. Now I am come to make thee understand what shall befall thy people in the latter days. For yet the vision is for many days. Then said he, Knowest thou wherefore I come unto thee? And now will I return to fight with the prince of Persia. And when I am gone forth, lo, the prince of Grecia shall come. But I will shew thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. And there is none that holdeth with me in these things but Michael, your prince. But I beseech you that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against power, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I got tired of that. And it's like God opened my eyes. And I began to see I've disappointed my friend, my friend, God. And now back to our program. Sometimes it takes you to step out of your comfort zone for, and, and then look at it and see that there really was no comfort there. So then I made a decision. There was an inward pulling. It's almost like there was a leash on me and that leash had extended to where I couldn't go no further. And I decided, which I thought I, it was me that decided, but it wasn't. It was, I didn't know until later, it was God saying, come back, come, come back. It's all right. Come back. And, and I said, I'm going back to God. I went and told the woman what I just went through. And I told her, I'm going back to God. I'm stopping everything I was doing. Are you going to come with me? She said, yeah. So for maybe a few weeks, all was well. But then it came a point where as I was going toward God, she dropped off. Everybody can't go through the Red Sea that God bless you to go through. I'm going somewhere, so stay with me. Remember when 2 Corinthians chapter 10, stay with me. So I, I, I started going toward God, then I was left alone. I looked at my DJ equipment one day and I just lost the desire to mix. But what I did do, 
the Lord used me to do a gospel tape. And I played some songs because I play keyboard. So I played some songs. I sang. And I did a gospel cassette tape. I, I can't explain to you the joy of being connected to God again. The checks that I was getting, they had run out. I got the first part of my lawsuit, so those checks had run out. So for a year, I was getting two checks a week from two different entities. God had blessed my life. And of course, I was sharing. But it came to a point where like the prodigal son, after I wasted all my substance, all my substance, I was going back into lack. And God welcomed me back. Everyone else had abandoned me. All the clothes I bought were nice, stylish clothes for the street. But I found that when I went back to that old ministry that I grew up in, I didn't even have a decent pair of clothes to wear. <laughs> oh, but if I was going to the club, I had clothes for that. But I didn't have the right clothes to wear to the place where God was supposed to be, which at the time, and at the level I was on then, he was there for me, God. So then it came a point where the Lord brought me out of there because I ended up by myself. And when I ended up by myself, I was watching TV on a local station, one of which God uses me to teach and preach on right now. And as I was watching this station, there was a brother up there preaching and teaching. He was doing some serious teaching. He wasn't hollering and screaming. And, ah! He wasn't doing none of that. He was teaching, explaining the word. And I stood there. I sat there taking notes. Then I started watching him every day he came on. I was taking notes. And then one day there was an inward unction in me to call him. So I did. And I asked him, would you come to my house? I need to see you. He came. He brought a deacon with him. And he asked me, brother, why did you call me here? I said, I don't know. I watch you on TV. Matter of fact, here's some notes I took. He looked at it and said, wow, this brother dissected this. And then he sat down, him and his deacon. And he said to me, brother, why did you call me? I said, I don't know. He said, well, we're going to find out. He said, let me ask you a few questions. One, are you saved? I said, yes. He said, are you sanctified? I said, yes. See, I knew what these words meant by now at this point in life. Mind you, this is three years after it was prophesied that I'd be teaching and preaching the word. So now I knew what saved meant, and I was that. I knew what sanctified me, and I was that. I was set apart. That's why God didn't allow no one to be around me, because I was set apart. You got to accept that consecration, because it's important. It's relative to your walk. And he asked me one question that changed my whole life. He said, are you filled with the Holy Ghost? I said, I don't know. He said, do you speak in other tongues? I said, no. He said, well, by the time I leave here, you will be. I said, okay. Now I felt like I did when Dr. Wilson said, God going to be using you to teach and preach. I said, okay. Now here I am three years later saying, okay. And so then the Lord used him to pray over me, to lay hands on me, to have me lift my, hold my head back, lift my arms up, and just say, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I kept giving him the highest praise. 
He said, brother, let your tongue go. And he paced back and forth and was praying over me. And the deacon was praying. And then the, the, the man of God touched my belly again. I mean, God was using him. Next thing you know, my tongue just went. I started hearing a language that I, I knew not was in me. Actually, the first words were, Badasa, Badasa. He said, that's not God. God don't talk like that. Let him control your tongue. And as I did, all of a sudden, there was an articulate, unlearned language that proceeded out of my mouth. Before that, my belly had started burning. Whoo! It started burning. And I experienced, I won't say I felt, because it wasn't no emotional thing. I experienced this burning coming up, coming up, coming up, and then out of my mouth, a language in which I could have never put together. And after that, he said, brother, you're filled with the Holy Ghost now. With the evidence, the biblical evidence of speaking in other tongues. And he said, you should go look at yourself in the mirror. And I did. And when I went, my eyes was big. Felt like I could lift the whole house. My eyes was red. Like fire. From that moment on, my life changed. I started watching more gospel programs, more teaching. I saw an apostle named Apostle Williams. He was teaching on... It's time to rebuke the devil. So now I'm inquisitive and there's an inward, well, I'm filled with the Holy Ghost now, so I can hear God saying, study on this. So now I'm researching this devil. But before then, when I ended up by myself, this is before being Holy Ghost filled and everything, when I ended up by myself, I used to go to a prophet, a friend of mine, Prophet Mike. And I knew him when we was in the world together. But I went to go talk to him. I used to say to him, yeah, this woman, and I'm alone, and blah, 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 and all of this, and all of that. I was going through a rough period in my life, and he was telling me, brother, you need to pack your stuff and leave. If you don't, it's going to get ugly. And I didn't listen to him, because I didn't understand. He was asking me to do, God was speaking through him, asking me to do something that I had not the faith to do. I had nowhere to go. I had all this DJ equipment and some clothes. I was, you know, what was I going to go? What was I going to do? I'm a, I've always been a loner. He said, listen, every time I see you, you coming to me asking for a word. Man, you draining me. He said, I don't, I'm not always going to have a word for you. You need to get filled with the Holy Ghost so you can stop coming to me. <laughs> and when I left and walked away from him, that's when I said, Lord, what is he talking about? Lord, if I need to be filled, fill me with the Holy Ghost. I don't know what it is. And I said it then because I didn't know him. I was still a babe. So that's when I started watching TV and saw Pastor Roach. And he came over and God used him to pray. And then I got filled with the Holy Ghost. Now I knew God and didn't have to go to nobody and say, what is the Lord saying? Because now I knew him for myself. This is 1993. By 94, I had been in, I, I was getting arrested left and right because God was using me to minister to someone. And the courts said, don't minister to them. Don't say nothing to them. If they want to blow their self up or their kids or kill them, they ain't got nothing to do with you. But the Holy Ghost was telling me, lay your life down for sheep. Okay. Then he sent me to ministries. At night, I'm up all night. And I would be walking the street. Seeing what was it that God wanted me to see. Why does he allow me to be out here at night? I'm going to base houses and everything where they smoke crack. I never smoke crack. But I was going in there looking for someone. There was someone the Lord put in my heart to minister to. And to be concerned about. 
and I'm watching all these people in bondage. Some people smoking crack and thinking things crawling on them. Some people smoking crack and taking off their clothes and running down the street naked. I'm looking at all of this and saying, these people are whack. And they looking at me going, why are you watching us while we smoking and you don't even get high? But God wanted me to see something about bondage and about the power of the enemy. So, in the daytime, God would say, go to this ministry. Go to that ministry. Go talk to this pastor. Go talk to that pastor. I would go to the ministries he would tell me to go to, and the doors were locked. They weren't open. And I was shocked. Because I'm like, Lord, wait a minute. When I, when I wasn't thinking about you, I'm walking down the street. I would see services everywhere. Now I'm noticing doors are locked. Lord, what's going on? God didn't say nothing. Then he blessed me to go talk to one minister. And I sat with him for a few hours. I saw an ashtray on his table, his living room table. And I said, uh, Pastor, uh, is it all right to smoke? He said, oh, you can smoke because Jesus' disciples smoked. They used to roll cigarettes. I asked him, where was the scripture at? Because at this time I was studying scripture. So if you told me Jesus wore pumas, I wanted to know the scripture. But he said, there is no scripture. It's just, you know, you just got to know that they rolled cigarettes back then. It didn't just start. Okay. Other ministers. I went to another minister and told him that my life was in the shambles and I was going through some things and the devil was tearing up my life. And he put his hand to his mouth and said, oh wow, well make an appointment with my secretary to come see me next week. I said, I need help now. God told me to come here. And it seemed like I cursed at him, according to him, because I said, God told me to come here. Then I started realizing these ministers, when you mention God, they don't want to hear that. But yet they wear the collar. And they say God sent them, and they work for God, and hallelujah, and they holding the Bible, and shouting, jumping, skipping, break dancing, and all of this stuff. And yet, they didn't want to hear the name God. So when I left that ministry, when I walked out of that carnal ministry, that bishop is dead now. Actually, both of the ministers are dead. But I walked out. And I looked straight ahead of me. And it's like I had an open vision. I didn't know it then, but I, I knew it after I got seasoned. And I said, Lord, if you ever call me a ministry, I will be there for your people 24 hours. I saw the shepherds weren't doing their job. They weren't doing what they were called to do. So now, I'm still out ministering to this person that God kept telling me to minister to. And I was ending up in and out of jail because I was running into the court. The court was telling me, stop ministering to them. But God kept saying, no, minister. So I was in a predicament not knowing who to listen to. If I don't listen to the court, then I'm going to jail. If I don't listen to God, I'm going to hell. I'd rather go to jail. So, I kept ministering, kept ministering, kept telling him, God want to deliver you. I mean, I was concerned about it. God want to deliver you. God, God, you got children. God want to bless you. God want to protect you. And I just kept going to jail. <laughs> then finally, the Lord released me from ministry. Now I got all of these court cases behind me and they had nothing on me. I was never charged with nothing really. So I watched the corruptness of the court and the police uh, force and the judges and the prosecutors. I watch, See, when you get close to God, the Lord bless, and you get filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. The Holy Ghost, He lives in you because then I learned He, by the time He filled me, I found out no, the Holy Ghost, He's not it. He is He. He's not a thing. He is God. He's a person, John 4 and 24. He is God, John chapter 16. Jesus said, He 
will lead you into all truth. So now I knew him. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm straight. I went to court. One time, the public defender said, I can't talk to you. The judge said he need to go see a psychiatrist because I was going in the court, taking my Bible, sitting it down on the, on the table and telling them, y'all can't touch me because I'm saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. They told me I was crazy. So they told me to go to a psychiatrist. I said, huh? God said, no, go ahead and go. So I went to the psychiatrist. I walked in her office. I said, listen, before we talk, I need to ask you a few questions. She said, what's that? I said, are you saved? She said, oh, yeah. I said, are you sanctified? She said, yes, I'm set apart for God. I said, are you filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues? She said, yes. I said, oh, we could talk. So I told her my situation and me and her talked for two hours. She gave me some pocket Bibles and everything. <laughs> some tracts, ministered to me. She said, all right, you can leave now. And I said, well, let me ask you a question. What is your report gonna be to the court? She said, there's nothing wrong with you. You're just in a spiritual battle. You're fine. And when I went to court, the public defender said, how is it anybody could talk to you except me? I just laughed because I watched God. And then I walked out of the court. Actually, they continued my case. My grandfather had called me, the, my grandfather that was a prophet and a pastor and a teacher. And he asked me to ride to North Carolina. No, actually he didn't. My mother called me. This was in 1994 of May. And she said, now this is the fourth year, okay? Four years before that, well, three years before, no, four years before that, I, it was prophesied I was gonna be preaching and teaching and preaching the word. So here it is, 1994, in May. I, my mother called me and said, listen, now I've been released from ministering to, to that person God assigned me to, but he had me ministering, you know, witnessing about him to others. And I, I had a quite, I lost all my DJ equipment because somebody stole it and sold it for $40. I had over $5,000 worth of DJ equipment and over a thousand albums, some not even open. I had a library and it, it got st stole, stolen and sold for $40 worth of crap. Did you see that? I told the court it was going to happen. The judge said, well, if it happened, then we'll arrest the person. And they never did. They lied. The, the cop that saw my equipment and knew it was mine, I, I figured that he would stand up for me. And he said, I, I, knew, I, didn't, I didn't know it was your equipment. I said, now, who, who else was it going to be? You saw me mixing on it when you came to the house. It's all right. You got to leave stuff when you come to God. There's things that you will lose in the natural because you gain things in the spirit. So they continue my case. My mother called me and said, Dad is going to drive down south and he needs you to go with him. I said, well, Ma, I have to go to sentencing on Tuesday. She said, well, that's the day I need you to go down south with him. She said, call the, now my mother has a prophetic anointing on her life. She does. She said, call the court and tell them you need to ride with your grandfather and they'll do it. Okay. She was not wrong any other time she told me, to do this and do that as a law letter. And now I have a ear, a spiritual ear where I can hear God. So I didn't hear her talking on the phone. I heard God. And I called the court and told him, my grandfather is driving down south. He's elderly. I, he needed me to ride with him. She said, okay, you could go. When, when you coming back? I said, Friday. No, I said, I, I'll be back probably Thursday, something like that. She said, well, Friday call us to let us know you're back and you can start your sentencing. Because now what they did is they, they railroaded me in court and they sentenced, they charged me with failure to appear in court. Because they said I had one court date and when I went, they said, oh no, it was another day. So now we're gonna charge you with failure to appear, give you 13 months, come Tuesday, start your sentence. I'm like, wow. <laughs> so anyway, that Tuesday I went with my grandfather. I went down to North Carolina and I went to a service with him and I heard this preacher, very powerful preacher. He was preaching. And he said the title was, Looks Don't Get It. 
and he started talking about Gerald Ford, I mean the Henry Ford, how he made the Ford cars, and if anything was wrong with the car, Ford could tell you what it was. He could just look at it and tell you because he made it, and he likened that to God being able to tell us about us and what's wrong, and, he, and only God could fix us. Oh, I had a time and a time with that. On the way down south, when we left New Haven, Connecticut at 11 in the morning, we got to North Carolina at 11.30 at night. But from 11 in the morning to 11.30 at night on this long drive, me and my brother, we went. I'm asking my grandfather all kind of questions because at that time, not only am I saved, sanctified, the Holy Ghost filled, but I have a, a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, for the Word of God. I want to know everything. I'm talking to ministers. I'm talking to pastors. Now I'm talking to my grandfather, asking him, Dad, what did this mean? What did that mean? What did this mean? And he was telling me some things. And finally, before we got to my uncle's house in North Carolina, before we started pulling in the driveway, my grandfather said, he said there was a meeting in heaven and God the Father said, man is so far from me, I have to bring him back to me. But who, who will go for me? Jesus said, if you make a body for me, I'll go. And the Holy Ghost said, I second the motion. I said, oh my goodness, dad, where's that at? He said, look it up. He said, by the time you find it, you'll be to find so much more. Okay, my grandfather always would do that. Look it up. You ask him a question, look it up. He encouraged you to research. So, and, and now that I have a lot of his books from his biblical library, his spiritual library, sometimes I run into notes that he took and I'm like, okay, dad was here. So anyway, when I got back to New Haven, I called the court Friday morning. And I, I, I actually... I went in, no, I called the court Friday morning. They said, there's a warrant out for your arrest. I said, why? They said, because you failed to come in on Tuesday. I said, but I called and some lady told me that I can go down south. I told them the situation and the story. They said, well, just come in and we'll see what the judge do. So I went in and I got in the public defender's office. I'm nervous. I got my Bible with me and all of that. I'm stronger now in the Lord. This is May 1994. I'm stronger in the Lord now. Came a long way in a short four years. So I went into the courtroom and the judge called me up. Now before going to the judge, I was outside talking, when they called recess, before they called my case, I was outside talking to a lady who told me her husband got arrested, he was innocent, he didn't do nothing, they charged him with drugs and all this and he didn't have it, it wasn't his, blah, blah, blah. And the Lord let me to minister to her and tell her how God will make a way. God will open doors for you. Now mind you, the last four years of that time, I, God has sent me to many Bible studies. I was in service every day except Saturday because there wasn't nothing open Saturday. I was at a Bible study on Monday, a Bible study on Tuesday, a, 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 work, a um, praise service on Wednesday, a, a open mic Bible study on Thursday, a, 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 um, some kind of service on Friday, and then Sunday I was at a ministry. So I, I mean, I, this was my life. And I was going home and research. Every time the minister would speak, I'd be writing down everything. And when I got home, I would look it up in the Bible to see if what they were saying were actually in the scriptures that they said they was. So I was, I was, at, I was much advanced by now. And I started learning things about God. And I said, wow, stuff people say this, you know, this is, this is kind of deep here. So... The Lord let me to minister to this lady and tell her, well, God, is he'll, he'll make a way. He'll open the door. Just believe him. Pray. Talk to him. Trust him. He'll deliver your husband. Yada, yada, yada. Okay. So I went in the court. Come to find out she was in the courtroom I was in, but I didn't know until I got ready to leave. Here's what happened. When I got in the courtroom and the judge called me up, when I got up there, he said, there's a rearrest warrant for you because you didn't come in to start your sentencing on Tuesday. And I told him what happened. He said, who was it that, called, that answered the phone? I said, your honor, I didn't ask the name. I wasn't even thinking that. I was just concerned about going down south, 
riding with my grandfather and all of that. And we went down there to see my uncle and you know, that's that's it. That's and the judge said, Bailiff, would you put Mr. Coleman in custody? So he the bailiff said, Come on, brother. And I went over to him and I went outside the courtroom. And before going downstairs, I looked at the bailiff, who, who was my cousin, but the judge didn't know it. I said, listen, cuz, I, I need to pray. Can I, go, can I go off to the side right here before you bring me downstairs and pray? He said, go ahead, go ahead. So I went in there. I got on my knees. I got in touch with my God. And I started talking to him. And I said, Lord, you the one told me to go down south. You told my mother to tell me. You blessed that lady to say go. You opened the door. You did this. You did that. Oh, I just put it all on God. Cast all my cares on him. And I heard the judge say to the bailiff, Bailiff, would you, I mean, Sheriff, would you get Mr. Coleman to bring him back up here? So my cousin tapped on the door. And he looked in and said, hey, because the judge wants you. So I got up, I went in front of the judge. The judge said, you said somebody told you you can go? I said, yes, Your Honor, That's, she I don't know her name, but she said I could go. And when I come back, get in touch with the court on Friday, which is today, to let y'all know I'm back. He said, I, you, I, get out of here. I can't, I can't lock you up, get out of here. And I said, praise God. He said, you come back. And he gave me the date to come back, which is June 1st. So what I did is I left. And I walked by. And that's when I saw that lady that God used me to minister to sitting on the bench. And she looked at me and said, wow. I said, told you the Lord to make a way. And there were some other kids that was next to her looking at me like, what in the world did he say? Why did Now, you know, everybody saw this. And I walked outside the court. And when I got outside the court, watch this. I noticed over on a bench, there was a brown-skinned older lady. It must have been in her 80s. She was sitting there rocking side to side. And I said, wow. Oh. And just like Moses, how it was, he was curious and went to the burning bush. I looked at her. And she was smiling. And I walked over to her. And I said, God bless you, mother. And she said, God bless you, too. She said, you're the ram in the bush. I said, huh? She said, you're the ram in the bush. You're going through this when someone else should be going through it. But they can't go through it. But you can. That's why you're going through it for them. I said, wow. God bless you. Praise the Lord. She said, God bless you too. And she kept smiling. I turned around and walked away. And when I turned back, she was gone. She was gone. Needless to say, the Lord blessed me to see angels. I see angels. I see demons. But anyway, that's... I walked away then, praising God. When I went to prison, I started... June 1st. Now, the real reason I went was for ministering, preaching, witnessing, when the court said not to. They didn't have nothing on me, so they had to railroad me and finagle dates and all of that and charge me with failure to appear in court. Okay. So I went into the county jail. I'm sitting there, June 1st, 1994. God has given me a sermon to write called Be All You Can Be in the Army of the Lord, 1 Samuel chapter 17, very first sermon. I'm writing this. I'm saying, Lord, I don't want to go to the prison, the big house. I'm thinking guns, barbed wire, dogs, Lord, no. Why would I go there? Why? God said something to me. He said, you know about my power. You know about me. But let me show you about your enemy. So they called my name, said, Coleman, pack up, you're going out. So they took me to a prison. When I got to the prison, it's called Willard. When I got there, there were fences I could just jump over. I'm like, wow. It looked like a college campus. I'm like, wow. And this is nighttime we arrived there. The next day, when I got up, 
I was waiting for them to give me my Bible and my property. And I walked down the hall and I ran into one of my other cousins. He's an ordained pastor now. But I ran into my cousin. He said, hey cousin, you still in the faith? I said, you already know I am. We shook hands and hugged. And, and I said, man, where, is there a Bible study around here? He said, yeah, it'll be a Bible study after lunch at one o'clock. I said, okay. So I went outside, because you could go outside. I went outside, as soon as my feet hit the tar, I had an open vision. I remember I filled the Holy Ghost, evidence of speaking other tongues. So I, at this time, in 94 of June 1st, I'm learned in demonology, learned in angelology, uh, um, learned in a lot of deep things, fasting, praying, spiritual warfare. I mean, in four years, God has took me to all kind of heights. So the moment my foot hit that ground, I had an open vision. God said, I'm going to send some men to you, five men, and I'm going to use you to teach them about the deep things of God. I said, oh, okay. I walked by a bench, a picnic bench. There was an Italian brother sitting there. He was reading the Bible. And he looked at me. He said, uh, hey, brother, what's your name? I said, uh, Alan. He said, my name is Frank. He said, tell me something. Can you explain this scripture to me? I said, what scripture? And it was Matthew something. And he, I said, read it to me. He read it. It was only me and him out there. He read it. And I was walking back and forth, getting lined up. You ministers know what that means. When you're listening to somebody read a scripture, you get ready to be used by God to explain it to them. You got to get lined up first. You can't just jump into, oh, I know what it means. No. So I'm walking back and forth, talking to the Lord. Lord, show me what this means. Tell me what it means. And then what the Lord did when he, when I was lined up, and then Frank finished reading, God led me to explain it to him. Now, as God was leading me to explain it to him, remember, it was only me and Frank out there. I'm walking back and forth in the spirit, being used by God to minister this word to him, to explain the scripture to him. After a while, a couple of hours, we heard the COs holler, count time, lunch time. And when I looked up and I came back to reality, so to speak, the whole table was full of men, full of men listening to the word. I went inside. I was like, oh my goodness, Lord, I, I don't believe you. I mean, wow, you never used me like this. After lunch was over, I was getting ready to go into where they was having Bible study. The guy that was supposed to come, his name was Jonas. He hadn't came yet. He was late. My cousin, who was not with me when God used, was giving me that sermon the night before at the county jail, my cousin said, that word God gave you last night, he said he wanted to use you to minister it now. I said, brother, what? How did you know? So the Lord led me to minister. Jonas came in. Right when God was leading me to tell the brethren that when you work for the Lord, he deposits into your spiritual bank account. He said, wait a minute, that's not biblical. What are you talking about? Now, I was, I'm like, you know, brother, if you know, if you let, wait a minute, I could explain it to you. No, that's not, that's false doctrine, blah, 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 blah. So I, I had to be cool and calm. I remember I was a martial arts instructor and everything, so I wasn't scared of nobody. But I had to be cool and calm. When he finished, I said, brother, if you let me explain, then you'll see what God was using me to say. He said, all right, go ahead, I'm listening. So the Lord let me to explain it. Store up treasures in heaven and not on earth. And as you work for the Lord, he deposits in your spiritual bank account blessings. So down here, when you say, Lord, I need a blessing. I need, Lord, remember what I did for you. God will withdraw and bless you. He said, oh, okay, yeah, that's, that's sound doctrine. And from that moment on, God appointed me as pastor and prophet of the ministry there. This ministry, the Word of God through Jesus Christ Street and Outreach Ministry, started June 1st, 1994, right there. In there, I was only there five months. The COs knew I was saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. They used to come to me for counseling, for prayer, and all of that. They always saw me studying. God started teaching me theology. I started studying Hebrew. I started studying Greek. I started studying big boy stuff. Started cross-referencing scripture. One thing God told me to do, he said, look in the Bible and tell me which denomination is the right one. When I looked, 
didn't see one, he said that's because there is no denomination in my body. Denomination is separation. Come out of the Baptist denomination. And I did. No problem. I did. When I came out and the Lord started using me to teach and preach, I, there was, I'm fast forward now, there was problems with the warden because they said no inmates should be teaching and preaching, but the Lord blessed me to do it. The Lord taught me how to set up a ministry. He taught me how to run a ministry. In jail, there's no money. So I learned it don't take money to run the ministry, but it takes the anointing. God started doing all of this in me. Then he said to me one day, you know, uh, you see these guys coming in here? I said, yeah, Lord, I was working in the kitchen, and then they fired me, which I didn't know why. I asked them, why you fired me? They said, oh, you don't cut it. But I was working hard. But the Lord allowed it to happen. I said, okay. So God said to me one night, you see these guys coming in here on Friday? Some of them don't have no money on their books. They have nothing, no nothing. And there's gangs in there and people that got a store and they're selling food. God said, I want to use your locker. I said, for what, Lord? He said, because I want to use it and fill it up and I'll show you who to give food to. I said, all right, Lord, you got to fill it up because I don't have no job and sure enough, ain't nobody sending me no, no money on my books. So there was some Spanish brothers came to me the next day and said, hey, Poppy, who, who irons your clothes, man? You wearing creases all in your pants and your shirt? I said, I do. Because, see, what they didn't know is before I came to jail, I was wearing suits every day. So I always stayed groomed. So the brother said, well, if you iron my pants and my shirts, I'll give you some suits and cosmetics. Next thing you know, fast forward, within a week's time, that locker was full. And when people came in and didn't have no food, God would use me to just walk up to them and hand them food. They would say, thank you. I said, no, thank God. The guys that had stores, when they ran out of supplies from selling two for ones, they would come to me and say, hey, Rev, can we get something out of the storehouse? And I would tell them, no. Mm -mm. This is for people that don't have. Yeah, but if you give me something, I'll give you two or three suits or two or three cosmetics or, some, or whatever. No. Brother, you got a store. And when you got your store, you be selling stuff to people. This, this storehouse are for the less fortunate and people that are hungry and people that ain't got nobody looking out for them. So the guys come to you and if they don't give you what they say they're going to give you, then you beat them up? No. They come here because it's free and there's no bondage. Uh, I, I tell you, the Lord taught me so much while I was in there. He taught me how to pray against the rain. He taught me how to tell a moon come from behind the cloud and to go back in Jesus' name. I, as I was studying deep theology, before I got ready to get out, I was studying the book of Isaiah. And I saw where Isaiah was demonstrating a Trinitarian conversation where God was saying, who will go for us? And Isaiah said, here am I. As I read it, now my grandfather, when he told me to look it up, he said, it's not going to say it like I'm telling you, but when you see it, you're going to know that's it. When I read it, I said, oh, my goodness, this is what Dad was talking about. So then when he came to pick me up, when it was time for me to get out of prison five months later, I didn't do 13 months. God only let me do five. The guards, they told me, we know you say, we know you sanctified for the Holy Ghost. We know you real. We know you're not in here for no crime. We've seen your, your record. We've seen your sheet, your jacket. When my grandfather came and got me, I said to him, Dad, uh, that scripture, the meeting in heaven, it's in Isaiah. And I told him where, and he smiled and said, yep, that's right. Now, while I was in prison, God brought me through the office of prophet, through the office of evangelist, through the office of teacher, and he used me as pastor. When I got out, I didn't know right away that he'd rested me in the office of apostle until he confirmed me. Now, by that time, he had also imparted the gift of interpreting dreams, the gift of interpreting tongues. That's why when people are chanting, God bless me to know it's a chant and not a holy tongue because of the gift of discernment and the gift of interpreting tongues. The point is, God could do a fast work in you or a slow work. When God brings you to the place in him, where he has destined for you, preordained. You're not weak. You're not soft. You're not scared of nobody. 
2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul said in verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. There was a brother, an older pastor. I met my father in the Lord in, in there, actually. And he introduced me to another brother, older brother, on the phone. And I won't say the pastor's name, but the brother, well, actually I will. His name was Pastor Knight. And the brother said to me, he said, Brother Allen, a Brother Coleman, he said, this when I was in prison, he said, the gifts God gave you will always get you through every trial in life. Use your gifts. And ever since then, I have. So when Brother Paul said that for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. When I got out of prison, I said, oh, all of my family, nah, my family probably mad at me, certain ones anyway. I said, all of my family that are in ministry and that are in the Lord, they're going to, they're going to accept me. They're going to be happy because they used to see me in the street and all of that. Now I'm, I'm a Christian. I'm strong in the Lord and all of that. I'm in ministry. I'm going to be welcome. It didn't go that way. Why? Because I came talking this. This. The word of God. The sword of the spirit. I didn't come with a Baptist Mid, uh, a Baptist um, doctrine. I didn't come with a Methodist doctrine. I didn't come with an AME doctrine, African Methodist Episcopalian. I didn't come with a Presbyterian doctrine or what they call a holiness doctrine. I, I didn't come with that. I didn't come with an apostolic doctrine. Even though I'm in the office of apostle, it's not by denomination, but it's by calling, by capacity, by office. I learned from studying founders and denominations that there's a lot of wrong in all of them and the only bit of truth are what they base the denomination on. But the rest of the stuff is garbage. It's junk. It's ju I know pastors that tell the congregation, God don't talk to the congregation, he talked to the pastors first. That's a lie. I know some pastors that say God don't speak. To nobody but the pastor. That's a lie. That's a lie. When I looked in the scriptures to see where there was a woman pastor at, God said to me, you don't see one, do you? No. God said, I didn't set that up. He said, you don't see women apostles, do you? No, Lord. I didn't set that up. So now he taught me something when he placed me over ministry in 1994, when he was using me to establish a work, he said these words, if it's not in my word, I didn't say it. That became the mandate. That became the ground rules, the instructions. Now there's a lot of people that are Christians that will go against that and say, God didn't tell you that because God told me I was a woman pastor. He told me I was a woman apostle. He did not tell you no such thing. I've even put a wager on the table and said to some sisters, if you can show me in scripture where there's a woman pastor, I'll become a Muslim. I'll get out of the field. Some have said Julia, Romans 16 and 7. It says Julia was of note among the apostles, which in the Greek means she was respected by. It didn't say she was one. There were no women apostles. There just wasn't, because that is a very dominant office. It is not godly for a woman to stand and say, but I beseech you 
that I may not be bold when I am present with that confidence. Wherewith I think to be bold against some which think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God and bring it into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, yes, every minister should say that. But the spirit behind that is a dominant. It's the way you say it. A sister can say it gentle, soft, meek. And a brother a man of God would say it with authority, threatening, almost. And that's what Paul did. Don't y'all let me have to be bold when I'm with you. Now, you might think that while I'm away, y'all saying that, well, he write letters and they're, they're tough while he's away, but when he's around us, he's soft. And Brother Paul was saying, don't let me have to show you different. Don't let me have to do that. This is important to know. I tell you, that's, that was a powerful show. That was really, really, really a powerful show. Join us the next time when the Lord leads us to go back in the scripture with some more information. Maybe it'll be with one of my friends. Maybe it'll be just me. I don't know. Either way, the Lord will be orchestrating the lesson. God bless you. And take care. <laughs> Till the next time. In Jesus' name. Lord, I just thank you for all that I have in you. And all that you are in my life. For all that you've done for thy servant. Lord, you're just so wonderful. I can't think of how else my life would be without you. As long as I have Jesus, I have a satisfied mind. This is my prayer. Sometimes I don't have food on my table.
Jesus said.